Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Last week, we were talking, of course, about Vatican secrets, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and abomin Abomination to Her. Okay? She looks so innocent, doesn't she? And so beautiful. Loving eyes. But she's a murderer. She's a destroyer. She's a drunk, and she's out to steal our vineyards. If you remember, if you, have, if you haven't seen last week's episode, I encourage you to stop here. I'll wait. Okay, are you back? Watch last week's episode. So this one, because I don't want to backtrack more, I want to move forward with the information I have for you. But um, we talked about how... The, the Bible story of Ahab and Naboth and his vineyard and Jezebel are seen now in the Catholic Church because the role of Mystery Babylon the Great, number one, we saw that she hates Bible Christianity. She hates the Word of God. She makes, she, she gets drunk off of the blood of fornication, which is why you have so much sexual perversion in this world. It is everywhere. Um, I've made this observation, and, and it is, I've talked to other pastors, and it is true. Practically every family in this country has an immediate or an extended family member that is a sodomite, and if you know what that term means, the LGBTQ plus, and they will be adding, um, what do they call it? Maps, minor attracted persons. They, see, they just used to call them uh, child perverts or pedophiles or whatever. Child rapists is what they are. Um, that'll be added before too long. The target is the children. The children are the vineyard. You understand it now? And what spirit is trying to get, that's, that's what Jezebel does. Jezebel, when Ahab couldn't get the vineyard from Naboth, Jezebel said, I'll get it for you. Right? So how do you destroy a country? Well, the Bible says that Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And it's the wickedness of a nation that will absolutely destroy it. Sodom and Gomorrah are our examples. We have other examples in the Bible, but those two are the most famous, which is why we call the Bible calls people who are LGBTQ plus sodomites. They don't have to be from Sodom. And Sodom, they just are, they commit the acts and the perversions of Sodom, so that's what they're called. There's even laws in our country, anti-sodomy laws, okay? There is a, you know, laws that say, well, you sodomize so-and-so, so you're going to go to jail for this long. We still use that example in understanding the perversions that get into people. And now we have in this country perversions in practically every family. And it's moving into the churches. I, I made mention on Pastor Mike Online here a while back that the denomination that we used to belong to, that we had gone, we've been gone for years because we saw them moving away from the Word of God. And the result of that is now they've taken a soft stand on LGBTQ+. Plus and a soft stand today will be a recognition, a welcoming, an acceptance of LGBTQ plus sodomy in the near future. It's happening right in front of our eyes with churches and denominations that took a soft stand years ago. Now, anything goes. And that's where everything goes. So. Jezebel, Mystery Babylon the Great, 
She steals denominations and destroys, has them destroyed. She steals families, homes, churches, the word of God, you name it. When she takes over, remember what Naboth wanted. When he wanted, or excuse me, King Ahab. When Ahab would have gotten Naboth's vineyard, he wasn't going to keep it a vineyard, leave it the way it was. Oh, no, no, no. He said, I'm going to change it into a garden of herbs. And that's the thing. When Jezebel gets into a church or she gets into a country, when Jezebel, Mystery Babylon, gets into a home and she takes over and steals it and the devil gets in there, he changes everything. Look what's happened with our Bible. In over 400 years, the words of this one Bible has not changed. No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. It has not changed. And yet, the modern translations, well, they're changing them all the time. Five different versions of the NIV. Two significant different versions of the New American Standard Bible. There's the 1995 version or the 2020 version. Take your pick. And they're going to keep changing them because they keep changing the Greek text. That's what Ahab was doing. He said, I'm not going to keep it a vineyard. I'm going to change it and turn it into something else. And this is where we stand right now. And I'm telling you that her, this is not Mary. Okay, and, and any statue that you would see of Mary is not Mary. Any, and I'm going to eventually get into Marian apparitions. And any appearance of Mary is not Mary. It's mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So let's get into the scriptures. Isaiah 47, 1, come down and sit in the dust. O virgin daughter of Babylon... So that is the Bible tying them two together. The virgin lady is Babylon. And Babylon is playing the part of the virgin lady. But she's not really a virgin anymore. She's a harlot. And she is the mother of harlots. So... Remember what I said last week about her wanting to, um, let's say, a, a denomination. The devil wants to, because, because Lucifer said in Isaiah 14, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Congregation is the, the body of God's people, the churches. Does the devil want to rule over churches? Yes. What's keeping him from it? The word of God, the law of God, and a pastor and a strong church that will stand with the word of God and they will say, this is the vineyard. We're not allowing it to be changed into anything. And so Jezebel says, oh, I bet I can do that. And so she gets in denominations. She gets in uh, churches, she gets in schools, she gets in families, she gets in countries, she is in everything. And so is the Catholic Church. And so while you had a denomination, in my youth, you know, I had this idea, denominations are bad, we should all get along. You know, when you grow up and you're going, well, I'm not going along with what they do. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to church over there then we see that there's a need for denominations. Just as my left hand is not the same as my right hand, even though they kind of look alike, they just don't, I can't shake my own hand. And that's how it is in the body of Christ. There are differences among churches. Not one church has all of it. And so, yes, there are differences in denominations. And so... The Vatican now, since 1963, with the Second Vatican Council. The spirit of Babylon working through the Vatican says, 
we're going to take over denominations. But we're not going to do it like we did, you know, back in the dark ages, you know, where we put people on the rack and we burn them at the stake in the middle of the uh, town. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to infiltrate. We're going to bring Jezebel's spirit in through the Bible colleges, through the seminaries, through the books, the scholars, the theologians, the Bible translations. And eventually, that denomination that used to belong to Naboth, that vineyard, won't belong to Naboth anymore because we killed him off. And now, it belongs to us. Okay? In 1963, the, the Second Vatican Council did something the Catholic Church had never done in almost 2,000 years. And that is recognize that any Protestants were in anywhere close to being Christians. It used the term separated brethren. And so now they say, we see them as separated brethren, so we're going to bring them back so they can be ours and under us, under the Pope's authority. So let's say a denomination years, years ago stood for the right, stood for the truth, the preachers preached the word of God and people were saved. Over time, Jezebel killed off Naboth, the word of God, the authority of God, killed it off. And then that denomination now is owned, whether it's overt or covert, by the Pope or, excuse me, by her. Okay, take a look at this. Ecumenicals, the Pope standing with Muslims, the Pope standing with leaders from all denominations, the Pope promotes, Pope Francis promotes ecumenism of blood and an audience with members of Christian world commun communions, the biggest ecumenical international organization. The Pope talked about the ecumenism of prayer, work, and blood. Oh, Jezebel loves that blood, doesn't she? Mystery Babylon, she gets drunk off that. Here we see Pope Francis in Finland with a delegation from Finland this year saying we cannot worthily spread the name of Jesus without bearing witness to the beauty of unity. And how many people have been deceived into believing that Catholics are true Christians. After all, they believe in the Trinity. After all, they believe in Jesus. They believe in God. They believe that in salvation by Christ's blood. Yeah, but they believe that they re-kill Jesus every time they hold a mass. And they believe that you say prayers to idols, which God said, no, you don't do that. And if you do that, you're none of mine. And on and on and on and on. And the idea that they have Mary now on an equal slate with Jesus Christ. I'll show you that. Let me move on. Oh, look at here. Here's Kenneth Copeland. You know, I knew uh, Kenneth Copeland was short, but I didn't think Pope Francis was that short. But apparently they're about the same size. Kenneth Copeland's laying hands on Pope Francis, oh, they're having a prayer time, aren't they? And oh, look, there they are. There they are standing next to the Pope. From the right, you have uh, Tony Palmer, Betty Robeson, James Robeson. He had a show. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he had a show for years on television, TBN, and even on uh, uh, circulated TV networks across the country, the James Robeson Show, okay? Um, Kenneth Copeland, he made sure he got a spot right next to the Pope. Because Copeland, you know, is a billionaire, so he bought his place. Brian Stiller, Carol Arnott, and John Arnott. You know who John Arnott is? 
He's the guy that started the Toronto Airport Church, the Toronto Blessing, where everybody started getting drunk in the spirit. What spirit is that? Babylon, that makes people drunk. That then spread out to the Pensacola outpouring where everybody got drunk. Pastors were coming from around the world to get drunk in Pensacola and take that back to their churches so they could all get drunk. And do you know what John Arnott and his fellowship of churches is called? The Vineyard. Well, this Bible's right. It, I mean, it's like spot on the target. The vineyard is under mystery Babylon the Great. All you got to do is recognize that if they're drunk, that's Babylon. And where'd they get it from? The original drunkards, the Catholic Church. In this picture, you have the United Bible Society's great men of uh, esteemed Greek knowledge who are working on working feverishly. See, look, they've got books all over the table. And they're talking about how this verse ought to be changed into this Greek word instead of the old Greek word. You have men like Bruce Metzger. And then the guy on the right, who's not wearing a tie and a white shirt. He's wearing a priest robe. He's a Jesuit named Carlos Martini, who would have been Pope after Ratzinger. Martini would have been Pope. He's a liberal. But Martini said... To all the cardinals there, if you plan on voting for me, don't give your vote to uh, Bergoglio from Argentina. And we'll turn this place upside down. Because him, Martini, and Bergoglio were buddies. Okay? So now you have a, a Jesuit plant. And, and by the way, he's no longer on the committee. Most of these guys are dead. So now they have new people on the committee. And did you know that up until, I think, last year, year before last, they still had a Jesuit priest on the New Testament Greek committee. That's what these guys are doing. These guys are the ones who are revising the Nestle Aland, because that's Kurt Aland sitting there next to Carlos Martini, the Nestle Aland Greek text. Then it's, what, 28th revision? Soon to be its 29th revision, which means they've changed it 29 times since the late 1800s when Eberhard Nessel came out with the first edition. And they're using the manuscripts that Brooks, Westcott, and F.J.A. Hort said are better than the 5,000 manuscripts group called the majority text from which the Texas Receptus comes from which the New Testament of the King James was translated from. So you got the King James on one side. You have Westcott and Hort in the late 1800s saying, no, 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 the Sinaiticus and the Vatican Greek texts are far superior than the 5,000 other Greek texts. Two, remember, remember what, how many people witnessed against Naboth? Remember how many people witnessed against Jesus? And their witness agreed not with each other? And when you compare the Sinaiticus with the Vaticanus, like 3,000 times just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the 
Sinaiticus doesn't agree with the Vaticanus. That's just in the first four books of the New Testament. But Westcott and Hort argued that those manuscripts were the best ones. And so it was those manuscripts that made it back to this committee with the Jesuit priest on it who knew the Vatican text was, I don't, I'm not, I don't know that he believes that it's a corrupt text. I think he just believes it's the right one. But remember, he's under her drunken spirit. Okay? So, guess what? Westcott and Hort, both of them, favored worshiping Mary. Hort said, Fenton Hort said, I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. Westcott said, I wish I could see to what forgotten truth Mariolatry, the worship of the Virgin Mary, bears witness. In other words, he's saying, that worshiping Mary probably has some great forgotten truth that we've lost. Oh, I wish I could find out what that truth was. See, she's the one responsible for these guys using the two corrupted texts that ended up in the United Bible Society with this Jesuit priest, which is now the Greek text that is in all the seminaries, most of the Bible colleges, most of the Bible institutes, is the underlying Greek text for every modern translation of the Bible in any language. The King James and translations of the King James in other languages. They're the ones who are not based upon the corrupted Vatican texts. You see, Mystery Babylon, she's done her job pretty well. And you know as well as I do how difficult it is to find a church that just preaches the King James. You get it, don't you? Okay? Now, you know, some people are probably going to, are, are angry that I'm, you know, like calling this thing, it's not Mary, it's Babylon the Great. Okay? And you're going, oh, you should die. God's going to get you. Mary's going to, whatever. Let me show you, you know, when I say the Catholic Church believes this and the Catholic Church says this and the Pope says this, they don't come up with this stuff on their own. Ephesians 2 tells us that everybody that's lost follows the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so we know that those powers in the Vatican are under the control of a spirit. What spirit is it? Mystery Babylon the Great. Now, she appears to them as Mary. And when they invent their doctrines concerning Mary and how exalted she should be, they're not coming up with that on their own. The spirit of Babylon is doing that and inspiring that in them. Just the same way the Holy Spirit inspired men of God to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance and write those words down, and those words are preserved for us in this book. She, which is another spirit that Paul warned us about, is the one who leads Catholics and Catholic bishops and Catholic priests and Catholic popes 
and just saying things like this. Mary, the morning star who lights our way. Did I read that right? Mary, the morning star. Mary, the morning star who lights our way. This is the third column in a series of response to the question about why we call Mary the mother of mercy. As my readers have already seen from the past two weeks, this mystery of our faith is so rich and wonderful. It could take a hundred installments to really do it justice. But I will limit myself to just four for now, with part four to come next week. Meanwhile, in this third installment, we will cover something that I will bet many of us have never really considered before. The fact is, one reason that we are right to call Mary our mother of mercy is that during her sojourn on earth, she performed a tremendous work of mercy for us all. She showed us the way to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. As St. Faustina wrote, Mary is my instructress who is ever teaching me how to live for God. My spirit brightens up in your gentleness and your humility. Oh, Mary, didn't I just say that the true source of all the Catholic Church's destruction of true Bible Christianity all over the world and all of their doctrines that are false, worshiping idols, worshiping Mary, I just said that they're coming directly from Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And you have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Saint Faustina. That's a new one. Who basically says, she's my instructress who is ever teaching me on how to live for God. So you have a whore, a harlot, for a teacher, instead of the Holy Spirit. The morning star, really? Mary as the morning star? The article says, as can be observed in these commentaries on the... Now, let me stop right here. Number one, St. Faustina is not an author of any book in the Bible. Number two... The commentaries that have been written and referred to in that article were written by Catholic priests, Catholic theologians. They're not quoting the scriptures. They're getting their words inspired to them by Babylon the Great. As can be observed in these commentaries on the titles of the Litany of Loretto, Cardinal Newman had a deep and tender devotion to the Mother of God, for the close of the month of May, he comments on the title, Morning Star. He notes that Mary is called by two names that convey her beauty. Mystical Rose. Oh, wait till you see what I found out about that. And Morning Star. Wait till you see what I found out about that. Anyway, but the later suits her best because... A rose belongs to the earth and has a short life. A star, instead, is high in heaven and abides forever. Stop right here. What is a star, according to the Bible? What is it? It's an angel. What did Paul say? Though we, or an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I again. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. I'm telling you, this Bible, if you'll read it, you'll find out that it's right on target. This Bible shoots way better than I do and never misses its target. Okay? Um, he writes, it is Mary's prerogative to be the morning star, which heralds in the sun. She does not shine for herself or from herself, but she is the reflection of her and our Redeemer, and she glorifies him. Do you know what that makes her? 
Lucifer. That's what it makes her. Let me read that again. She does not shine for herself or from herself, but she is the reflection of her and our Redeemer, and she glorifies. That's Lucifer, the light bearer. Okay? So they have a little song or a little prayer. Holy Mary, morning star, you always lead us to your Son, the Father and the Holy Spirit. Be always close to us, guiding us to the blessed Trinity. Now, this is what we call in theological circles blasphemy to refer to Mary mystery of Babylon the great the mother of all its abominations of the earth to refer to her as the morning star is blasphemy so if the NIV or any other Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O morning star? Well, that would be blasphemy, wouldn't it? Um, let me show you this thing about the rose first. See, they called her the mystical rose. Now, you know, take a look here. There's a rose, and you know that what Catholics pray with is called a what? Rosary. And what a rosary does is Catholics are instructed to pray 150 times a day. You know, it just occurred to me you see that the 150 times is based upon the number of psalms that are in the Bible. It's also based upon the number of days of Noah. 150 days exactly that the waters prevailed on the earth. And it's also the exact amount of time being five months that the locust with the scorpion tails prevail on the earth. So they have a rosary which when you use it, you use the beads to count the number of prayers so you don't miss one. Okay? But what is it about a rose? You know that roses are symbolic uh, in the mystical world of like secrets. A rose, you know, when it's closed up, it's got something hidden inside of it, something beautiful. But it's keeping it secret, and then it opens up. And that, it's similar to, I, I went to uh, Manly Hall again, and that it's similar to the idea of the lotus in Eastern mysticism. The lotus is uh, very, very sacred in Hinduism because when it's folded up, it's protecting a secret. When it opens up, you'll find that Rama, the chief god of Hinduism, is hiding in there. Now, Brahma is basically the Antichrist. So whether it's the rose or the lotus, it's still the same concept. And we also know something about, well, all roses everywhere on the earth. What is it about rose stems, rose plants, rose bushes? They bear two things, roses and And what are thorns a, a figure of? Sin. So what did they put on Jesus' head? A crown of thorns. So it represents the Antichrist, the man of sin, the king of sin, who was destroyed at the cross. Amen? 
because the Bible says that Jesus made a show of his enemies openly, crown of thorns, and he took them to the cross. And he killed them. He's like Samson. He killed more of his enemies in his death than he ever did in his life. Amen. 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 I love this. Um, getting to this, this prayer thing, is there anything in the Bible that tells us that we have to pray 150 times every single day? No. Is there anything in the Bible about saying uh, Ave Maria, Grazia Plena, Dominus Tecum? No, 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 let's see. Yeah, Dominus Tecum et Benedicta tu in Muli Eribus. I'm probably messing my Latin all up. But anyway, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now and in the hour of our death. Amen. And then start all over again. Is there anything in the Bible about Repetitive prayers. Yeah. Jesus said, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Jesus specifically said, don't pray that way. So what, do, what does, what does uh, Babylon tell all of the people to do? Oh, you got to repeat the prayers. God can hear you. And if you, I mean, if you only pray, if you only pray like a hundred times, that's not enough. You got to pray a hundred and fifty times. You know how we know? Mary told us. I almost guarantee you. I almost guarantee you. There is within the the ranks of Catholic popes and priests and monks and nuns and everybody else. Somebody who will attribute the idea of praying 150 times a day, every day, to something that Mary told them to do. Now, I'm not going to put any money on it, but I'm just, that's what I think. Getting back to the rose. What did we say it bears? It bears roses and thorns. And here's the, the thing. Somebody laying in a casket and the rosary is laid over their hands. That's because Catholics are told that rosaries have very special grace powers in them, magic powers in them, that if you have a rosary in your hands, then you get time shaved off your thing in purgatory. That God's graces can be manifested in, in your hour of death, your time of death, so that if you have any remaining sin, then that rosary in your hand can cut off some of it. Some even, it's... It is taught and believed that if you have a rosary blessed by a pope and you're, you have it on you when you die, you go right to heaven. Now, how do you suppose you get a rosary blessed by a pope? You pay lots of money for it. Let's move on. What bears thorns? And why is it significant? Hebrews 6. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. <sighs> Judges chapter 2. This is what God said concerning the people that they were supposed to run out of Canaan land. We know that they represent principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. And God said, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. 
That's what the thorns represent. That's the significance of the rose. Mary being called the mystical rose. Why? Because she bears thorns and briars. And she's cursed, not blessed. And she curses and not blesses. They got it all wrong. Now, back to Mary being the morning star. In the 18th century, they developed a set of prayers called the Chaplet of the Ten Evangelical Virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You remember last week when I was reading in Ezekiel 28 about the, the stones that covered Lucifer and the fact that there were ten of them? Here, the Chaplet of the Ten Evangelical Virtues of the Blessed Virgin Mary, you can see them here. She's called the most pure, the most prudent, the most humble, the most faithful, the most devout, the most obedient, the most poor, the most patient, the most merciful, the most sorrowful. There's 10 of them there. And the article goes on to say, which is still recited by the Marians, there's a group of priests called Marian priests, and they are strictly devoted to Marian worship, Marian theology, Marian doctrine, everything concerning Babylon the Great, they're responsible for it. So guess what spirit they're listening to? It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not the Bible. It's Mystery Babylon. Um, let's see here. The symbol that the Marians used for Mary's ten gospel virtues was a ten-pointed star. With each ray representing a virtue. One of their earliest saintly founders, the venerable Father Casimir Wyszynski, opened his own meditations and Mary's virtues with these words. Only a Polish person can pronounce those. He says, Mary is the noble star rising from the house of Jacob, whose rays illuminate the whole world. Let us then watch the rise and movements of this brightest star carefully. Let us follow her. Let us rise up from the sleep of death by sin. If we want to see this morning star rising, we must zealously imitate the ten virtues of the Virgin Mary. For, in, in other words, works. If we want the morning star, we must do these works. And Ephesians 2 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For just as a star once led the three wise men to Jesus as he lay in a stable in Bethlehem, so will this morning star, shining with the ten rays of these evangelical virtues, lead us to Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly kingdom. I can't, I get angry every time I, I read this stuff. It's blasphemy. And it's coming from Babylon. That's where they're getting their doc. They're getting them from her, not him. Who's the morning star? This article, I mean, we, we started this thing out back here. Mary, the morning star who lights our way. And Numbers 24 says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. And a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheph. You see, they teach that Mary is the star of Jacob. And the fact that they're teaching that she's the morning star Remember? Look at this. Um, look at this. Uh, this ten-pointed star. You notice a pattern here. Most pure, most prudent, most humble, most faithful, most devout, most obedient, most poor, most patient, most merciful, most sorrowful, most high. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast sent in thine heart. 
and all, all modern Bible translations either have how, how are you, how have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, or star of the morning or something, but it's usually morning star. It, it, and the Hebrew word there is halal, and all it means is bright, shining. That's all it means. I will, ex I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, which means the church, in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like, there it is, the most high. They're calling her the most obedient, the most devout, the most faithful, the most humble, the most prudent, the most pure. You know, even if I were to just take Jesus and set him aside over here just for a minute, the most humble person in the Bible was not Mary. It was Moses. Okay? And that's what the Bible says. Or Abraham. Abraham showed humility and meekness when he let Lot choose whatever land he wanted. Did not say Mary. Revelation 22 tells us who the real morning star is. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Revelation 2.28, I will give him the morning star. Who is the morning star? It's Jesus. So here again, we've got her taking the place of him. That's blasphemy. And what does the beast open his mouth and do? Blasphemes God. She's also referred to as the mother of the saints. I was not born of Mary. She's not my mother. And by the way, this idea that Mary was without original sin, well, that was, where did that come from? It didn't come from the Bible, did it? Because Mary referred to Jesus, at, or the Lord, as her Savior. She gave birth to the one who would die and save her from her sins. She wasn't sin-free or sinless or born without sin. She wasn't. When you see anything called the Immaculate Conception, it's not referring to the birth of Jesus. It's referring to the birth of Mary. But I do have a mother. The inner man, the new man in me, is conceived by God, but birthed by Galatians 4.25. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. See, I like that doctrine better than the other one. Heaven is our, is our mother. And now, think, he's talking about Jerusalem above, which is free. A city. What is Babylon? A city. So you can decide to either be born of heaven or hell. Because that's what Babylon represents. Her steps lead to hell. That's, that's her. Hell is her. And the Bible calls the Antichrist the son of perdition. What is perdition? hell makes sense doesn't it we're born of heaven Jerusalem they the lost people of this world the Antichrist is born of hell here's some of the this is from Wikipedia the dogmatic titles of Mary Number one, Mother of God. Council of Ephesus decreed in 431 that Mary is Theotokos, God-bearer. Because her son Jesus is both God and man. 
Virgin Mary. The doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary developed early in Christianity was taught by the early fathers such as Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and others. Well, not by Peter and Paul and James and John and Jude and Matthew, Mark, Luke. Not by any of those guys. They didn't teach that. They didn't even teach anything like it. Okay? Uh, the Immaculate Conception, we talked about that. The Queen conceived without original sin. Um, Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception, Pope Pius, uh, made that up. But where did he get it from? What spirit inspired him to do it? What spirit guides these guys? I mean, like I've said, to go to be a Catholic priest, you get as much training as a medical doctor. So you've got some of the smartest men, most intelligent men in the entire world who are part of it. And some of them go on and get, you know, uh, doctorates in other disciplines, science and medicine and all kinds of stuff, music and art. And I mean, these guys are brilliant. Some are geniuses. And they read the Bible, surely they do, but there's a spirit in them that will not let them believe that you're not supposed to pray to a statue because they do it. So it's got to be a spirit. It's not their mind doing it. It's the spirit working through their wicked heart. Uh, the assumption, the belief that the Virgin Mary was assumed body and soul into heaven upon completing the course of her earthly life, was declared a dogma in 1950 by Pope Pius XII. Now, here's what's called devotional titles of Mary. In the Loretto Litanies, Mary's prayers are invoked under more than whatever. Her titles include Ark of the Covenant, makes me it it is I, I get I am zealous for this book I'm zealous for the Word of God I'm zealous for the things of God and I'm like Jesus Jesus got angry when he saw the the, the money changers in the temple of God and he threw them out turned their money over and, and whipped them he got God Jesus hates violence are you kidding me I'd hate to be one of the money changers. I'm not a violent person, but this stuff, it angers me. Ark of the Covenant, Comfort of the Afflicted, Our Lady, Gate of the Dawn, Holy Mary, Immaculate Heart of Mary, Mother of Christ, Mother of Mercy, Mother of Sorrows, Mother for the Journey, Mother of the Church, we talked about that. Mystical Rose, we talked about that. Our Lady of the Annunciation, Our Lady of Charity, Our Lady of Providence, Our Lady of Ransom. Our Lady of Solitude, Our Lady of Ransom. You know what that means, right? That if you're under the bondage of sin, sold under sin, Mary's the one who pays the price, the ransom. She's taking the place of Jesus. So it can, it can truly be said that the true head of the Catholic Church, the Church of Rome, is not the Pope, it's not Jesus, it's not God, it's not the Holy Spirit, it's not even Peter. The true head of the Catholic Church is Mystery Babylon the Great. By taking the titles that belong strictly to Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit or God the Father or heaven above is blasphemy. When you make yourself like the Most High, you're a Lucifer. Is what you are. Uh, I've shown this before. There is... Mary, who herself, they call her the Ark of the Covenant. Now, 
in her chest um, is a great big giant emblem of the sun. That that I think that is also a, a, a big um, Eucharist wafer. But when Lucifer said in Ezekiel 28, I sit, I am God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas. The seat of God is the Ark of the Covenant, and who's there on it? Mary. Taking the place of God. See, I'm telling you, the head of the Church of Rome is Mystery Babylon the Great. Um, here are other names and things for Mary. Advocate of the church, like the judge of Israel. Advocate. No, 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 no. The Bible says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Mary was never mentioned as being part of the advocacy between us sinners and God who sits in judgment over us. Jesus is our advocate who either says, uh, Father, judge, his sins are covered by my blood, or Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Mary's got nothing to do with it. Mediatrix of all graces. In other words, if you want grace from God, you must get it from Mary, the mediator. There's one mediator. We've covered this. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Again, it, she takes the name advocate. She takes the name mediator, applies it to herself. Again, this is not this. Is not this. And I, listen, I love Mary from the Bible. She was a chosen vessel of God to bear the Son of God into this world. And for that, she gets credit, but she doesn't get our prayers. And this fraud posing as Mary is not Mary. It's Mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations. Queen of Angels. Uh, Marian apparitions are said to testify to Mary's gift of prophecy. That's coming up. It's not this one, not, but it's coming. Now, when it mentions Our Lady, Isaiah 47, 5, Sit thou silent and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. And I want you to think about that. How many, I've got a list here of the different ways that Mary was called Lady. Here, the lady of the kingdom. Remember, the word lady is the female title Lord. And what is God's name? The Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It even says that in the Greek, using the word kyrios, meaning Lord. So that's God's name. She's taking God's name. I'm the lady that you pray to. I was wroth with my people, verse 6. I have polluted mine inheritance. I have given them into my hand, into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. And thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever. So that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. Therefore hear now this, thou that art given to pleasures, Thou that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me, I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment, in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee in their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Two things he mentions here. Sorceries. It is sorcery when the priest claims that he can transmute a piece of bread 
into the living flesh or the dead flesh because he just killed Jesus all over again into the dead flesh of Jesus Christ. That's sorcery. That's not the act of God through the priest. It's sorcery. And he says the abundance of thine enchantments. You know what an enchantment is? Enchantment has the word chant in it. What are the Gregorian monks known for? Their chants. There's even recordings now of Gregorian monks singing their repetitive prayers to music over and over. And people will listen to that and meditate, not meditate the way the Bible says, think on these things, but as a way of emptying their mind so that whatever God lives on the inside of them, whatever spirit resides inside of them can speak to them in whispers the way a familiar spirit does. And again, what did Jesus say about that? When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do for they that they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And that's why these monks, nuns do it too. That's, that, that's why they got, think they got to say Hail Mary 150 times a day. And then Our Father 150 times a day. And then whatever else they do. That's why the church imposes as a punishment repeating these prayers over and over again. Messed up people. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to read you some of these titles given to Mary. Our Lady of Confidence, Our Lady of Consolation, Our Lady of Good Success, of Guidance, of the Hens, that's weird, Our Lady of Peace, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, Our Lady of Prompt Succor, Our Lady of the Rocks, Our Lady of the Turning Eyes, Our Lady of Bethlehem, these are named after different places. Our, like Our Lady of Lebanon, Our Lady of Loretto, Our Lady of uh, Menaog, I think it might be the Philippines. And then you have titles associated with apparitions. Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of All Nations, Our Lady of um, Caravaggio, Our Lady of China, Our Lady of Fatima, Guadalupe. Our Lady of uh, Mount Carmel, Our Lady of uh, the Pillar, Our Lady of the Snows, Our Lady of Walsingham. Right here, it's a scene from a movie. Our Lady of Guadalupe. Wait till you hear what she said that everybody had to do. Okay? You just wait. The next time we get together, I'm going to take you through some of these so-called so apparitions, and you'll see the blasphemy coming out of her mouth. You're going to see a difference between her and Jesus Christ. All right? This is Pastor Mike. You're the reason why we do what we do. Pray for us, because you know from our story about Jezebel, she don't like preachers who preach the word of God. Okay? We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.